or is it I? Okay. So all of you, we're gonna. This will be how we're gonna make money. We're all gonna generate electricity. I'll sell it off and use that money to help you. <laughs> Next, another great innovation. I didn't put canning down too, but canning of food and refrigerated cars. Those would revolutionize food. Gustavus Swift, his company would perfect these refrigerated cars. They've been playing with refrigeration since the 1820s. And once you have refrigerated cars, this would change completely how you produce food. Armor would perfect it. There's still Lewis Armor. They both still make canned food. Who likes? What's that one? I just saw that. The Hormel makes a version of Spam called Sneet. Okay, moving on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hmm? Well, Armour also did refrigeration, but also better canning techniques to can and preserve food. You combine these two and you've just changed the entire way that people get food. Every town used to have a place where they would slaughter the animals. That would be for those who could afford meat. In fact, you would be there, it was right there, there'd be blood and gore all the time. In fact, poor families would go send their kids to go get a bucket of blood. Protein. What do you have? What could you use the bucket of blood for? Oh, no, no, it's soup, sausage. Yeah. That's disgusting. No, it's not. <laughs> if you eat meat, there's blood everywhere. But all of a sudden that's gone now. Because now with railroads, refrigerated cars, and new canning techniques, they could take these small individual little you know, feedlots and slaughterhouses or you know, butcher shops in terms of mass operations. This is Chicago, the butcher to the world. Now you have to all go there and make it mass, feed, slaughter, can, cut up, and send this meat out. And think how that changes food. Instead of going to a butcher or something like that to get it right there when it's fresh, it changes the taste for food. People like now kind of older meat, a little bit spoiled beef. Yeah, oh yeah, that's, that's, you get hamburger, it's not fresh. Nobody eats fresh hamburger. I mean, they let it age. What's age? It's spoiling. I mean, that's, that's taste change. And the other thing is, though, you have little isolated markets for various things. Once you have this kind of stuff, you can have a grocery store. And then think about what happens once you get cars. You don't need little grocery stores anymore because they're now inefficient. What do you get? The big supermarkets. All of this starts when you think about this rippling effect from these inventions. You know, electricity. You know, you have railroads and then steel, so for better train, you move more goods. Better canning process. And so, especially steel, so, you know, they used lead cans before. I'll let you ponder about that on your own. And now, all of a sudden, it changes everything how people eat. And they just their expectations of life. And also cleaned up towns a lot. You have to walk through rivers of blood. There's stories about that. Go... Your last chance call here where the Shriners, uh, the Shriner Hall is, and uh, yeah, there used to be the slaughterhouse right there. Blood everywhere. If you've been to one, you know what I'm talking about. Well, next, let's just talk about Edison. Edison would be the classic innovator in this era. It's not just an innovator because he was incredibly intelligent and gifted, but he was. What Edison did is he had all his inventors who worked at his Menlo Park lab in New Jersey, that's the Wizard of Menlo Park, signed a contract that if they invented something, who'd get the patent? Okay. Edison would get it. So we don't really know what Edison invented. <laughs> what he, but what we know is he made sure he got the patent, so he got the credit and the money. He'd start General Electric, which is now a major corporation. And that's the way it is today. Virtually all patents, Virtually all that are valuable are owned by corporations. The people who work for them, they work on contract through corporations. Even colleges would take, they'll have their researchers work on them and they'll be underfunded by corporations a lot of the time and then go and then so they can profit from them. Yeah. What did you say he created? He, he, he um, made all, his, all the technicians who worked at his Menlo Park lab sign a contract so he would get the patent for their inventions. So then you said he like had a company or something? Yeah, General Electric. 
which is still a major corporation today. In fact, I was watching um, a, a uh, football game on what day? I can't remember what day it was. Must have been on the second when I got just when I got back, and they had like six really annoying General Electric ads in a row. <laughs> I should I went about broke the TV. Thanks, Edison. So the light bulb. He did not invent the light bulb. In fact, they've been playing with this for years because they realized that metal glows when you run electricity through it. The problem is either it didn't glow enough for to use or the metal broke. His lab came up with the filament that would glow and not break and last for 50, 60, then 100 hours. Once you have the light bulb, you've changed everything. Now you, you can have factories run 24 hours a day. You get rid of much of the fire danger in cities because you get rid of the coal or the kerosene lighting. All of a sudden, think about what this does just for towns and how people live. I mean, everyone kind of closed up when sundown. All of a sudden, now it can open up. And this was a big deal when you get those hot, awful you know, cities that are paved and in the summer in New York and it's 14,000 degrees outside, but it's pitch black and you don't want to go out. All of a sudden, all this lights. Go out at night when it's a little bit cooler. The phonograph he invented. And the phonograph originally was a tube, a wax tube with bumps on it that a stylus would go over. A stylus would go over and would vibrate, transmit it down a wire through an amplifier that he invented. I'll tell you more about that in a second. That's music and the spoken word. And the great thing about that was, oh, eventually they took this and flattened it to a vinyl record that turned to be more efficient, hold more songs on it. When I was your age, that's what we had. We had LPs, we got records. And I like the fact that the LPs then went away because it would scratch and all kind of hum and stuff. But now all the hipsters are buying them again. I think that's I gotta wait me. I got I got all these records. Some of them But you reverse the process, you have to speak into a mic and it digs into a, a wax tube and makes ridges, and you have the first tape recorder called a dictaphone. You'd speak into it. Everything you try to call it the Edaphone, get it, Edison, Edaphone. <laughs> and here's Thomas Edison working with this. You were talking to it. They still use these up into the 1950s. Eventually, it wouldn't be that much or that much of a stretch to having, instead of making ridges, essentially put it on magnetic tape. Eventually, that's come. And then... 1970s started digitizing and things changed dramatically. He also did the motion picture camera. The motion picture camera would, well, very quickly, it went from being a novelty to an absolute sensation. And then by 1910, they're making full length motion pictures. Silent, because the, there was no sound issue. And they couldn't quite get the sound. The, the, dicta, the dictaphone didn't make a good enough sound. It was hard to mesh them. But they filmed all these movies in New Jersey. But you know that New Jersey today is not the motion picture capital of the world. <laughs> Why would they go to Southern California? Hollywood, which was nothing more than, literally nothing more than a couple shacks would become. Yeah. Well, West, because you could film them there, so, yeah, but but you also film other things in Hollywood, too. Yeah. Was that the lighting? The golden the or well, there was an issue with the light. I mean, but this, you got the right sunset, but. Uh, <laughs> but you're on the right track of light. Weather, it's sunny every day. It doesn't rain. So you can, you can see tomorrow we can film. New Jersey, it could rain. That's why Montana will never become the motion picture capital. Not that it rains here, but we don't have great weather. Yeah, they might come up here and film something, you know, one little bit and get the heck out. California, it doesn't rain. So you know, you can film. And also, they didn't have laws with like the Wild West in California back then. Which all I'm going to say is, but if any movies with horses, poor horses. Right. So, Alexander Graham Bell, another inventor. So all those were Edison. Graham Bell, the phone. What was it, Hamilton? I can't remember. But Graham and the phone. He actually used the inventions of eight others and combined it. He was actually looking for something to aid, aid the deaf, but came up with something else and. The thing is, this where you put your ear, that's a model of his first phone. Couldn't really hear anything if you held that to your ear. It would be Edison who tried to come up with a speaker for his phonograph.
by running the sap, by running the electrical waves through charcoal. That's how they came up with the first speakers. And you rip apart an old phone, and they stop like a little layer of charcoal. I guarantee you that phone right there in the headpiece has charcoal on that speaker. Just rip it apart, and there's like a little packet, and it's charcoal. They run it through, and that amplifies it. The best speakers you buy today, if you want to buy really good speakers for like a stereo sound for your house, that's charcoal. Not the, yeah, so you just take it right from a barbecue. And just Not that, it's a little different. It's kind of charcoalized iron and a few other things. But the big technological debate would be between AC or DC, alternating current or direct current. To Australia. But I like AC and DC. They have two songs they just do over and over again with different words, and they're two pretty good songs. <laughs> If everybody knows ACDC, you know exactly what I mean. Yeah. But that's Edison, who, by the way, was electric. He could just hold a light bulb and it would go on. <laughs> but, anybody believe that? He'd have to plug himself in. Tesla came up with alternating current. Edison was a promoter of direct current. Batteries are direct current. And what direct current is, you take the power source. And it runs down just one wire. Think about a copper wire. A butte would explode, literally, at this time because of the copper. And you have one wire to whatever you're trying to power. Batteries are direct current. And Edison threw everything into direct current. The advantage of direct current was that it was much safer. Much safer. The disadvantage was the power would bleed out. So it couldn't go very... Uh, big distance. In fact, Edison's plan was that every house would have a, or, or house or city block would have like their own little mini electric dynamo. Factories would have a bigger dynamo. And therefore, they'd all just power themselves through direct current. Actually, there's some advantage to that, but some huge disadvantages, I think you can probably guess. Well, Tesla, his idea was that's inefficient, and because we ought to have all these electric dynamos and the power. Too much power bleeds out, so it can't be very far. What Tesla did is, imagine it being a loop. So instead of one wire, you have the power source A, you're powering B. It's a loop of two wires. So you have a little bit of power going that way, and it kind of makes the full loop. And then you set a power this way, it makes the loop back this way. It's at the speed of light. So it's you know it's almost instantaneous to our point of view. And it was really fast, back and forth. So it's basically a continuous power source, but not one direct line. And what that means is there's less power in each little burst to bleed out. So you can have instead one big electric generating facility powering places all over, which is more efficient. But this is really dangerous because let's say you flip the switch. What you're doing when you flip the switch is when you flip a light switch, what you're doing is you're connecting the loop. You're bringing the two wires together so the power goes like this. So the problem is, if you want to connect the loop, you can connect it, let's say, to your forehead. You see the problem. It's really dangerous. Really dangerous. Much more dangerous than direct current. And that's what Edison said. Yeah, it's more efficient, but you'll kill people. In fact, to prove it, there was a circus elephant by the name of Topsy. Topsy was condemned for murder. That I'm not making up. He killed his handler, which if I was a circus elephant, I could see being mad at my handler too, but trampled them to death. And they condemned him to die. And Edison said, let me kill him. And so they strapped him up and he used alternating current to kill Topsy. Uh, that's, uh, this is really that's like <laughs> yeah, but how many elephants have killed after that? But <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. And yeah, actually, filmed it. Can you change it? Wait, that's what the electric chair is. Yeah, it's just a alternating current. Yeah, you're connected to wires, and you when you <laughs> you ever seen like that, like a levers like that? You're just connecting the loop, and power runs through the person. So basically what it is, you got one source here, one source here, and it goes through. And it's, it's unbelievably horrible, beyond comprehension, awful. I know, as opposed to the other 
execution methods, which are so fun. But <laughs> it wasn't enough. And it was pretty much clear that Tesla's invention, but Tesla's invention was stolen. This is one of the big conspiracy theories in history. Stolen, or he, Tesla was just kind of, he was off inventing sort of all sorts of things. He thought he invented a death ray or an earthquake machine. He was, Tesla was an interesting guy. George Westinghouse of Westinghouse Company. He's the guy who did the General Electric Power Suit. And that's our power system today. But it is really inefficient. As much as 40 to 50% of the electricity bleeds out. Has anyone ever stood under one of those really high, um, those really uh, big power lines? Like, um, anyone ever stood under one of those? Yeah. And what do you notice? Because that's all the electricity bleeding out. Yeah, if, if we were smart as a country, we would spend billions of dollars because you could do this. And if you get that from 40 to 45 percent bleed and bleeding away down, let's down to let's say 10 percent only bleeding away, that would that would change everything. That would be a game changer. And I mean, that would change so much it's not even describable. Instead, we're worrying about stuff that's 40 years away, like self-driving cars. It irritates me. <laughs> you got to redo the entire. Tesla already has one set of releases quite quick. You, you got no. You got to you got to redo the entire highway highway system of the country. Trust me, that's not going to happen by 2020. Let me rephrase that. That ain't going to happen ever. <laughs> so, no. <laughs> they're they're saying they have to get investors. It works. Oh yeah, people buy it. And so look at all these inventions. So we have everything from you know, the transatlantic cable. Think about 1866, the first transatlantic cable, Atlantic cable for telegraph. Isn't that just amazing? Dynamite, 1866. And yes, Nobel, uh, who was a Swede, was very, very guilty about this because he assumed nobody would be crazy enough to fight a war once we have this such a destructive weapon. <laughs> silly, silly, silly. <laughs> That's why he that's why he endowed the Nobel Peace Prize because he felt guilty. It's true. And uh, the typewriter, we can blame blame his invention for the weird keyboard we have today. You know, we have the E and period, you know, like that. So you type slower so it doesn't jam the, the, the old typewriters, but now we're stuck with it. Because it doesn't make any sense now, does it? But that's why. Yeah. How can we have air brakes before airplanes? No, air brakes are hydraulic brakes for trains. And that was a major investment. Because before, every train had to be stopped by it. Every individual car had these. You would turn a crank, and that would press a disc, you know, like a disc brake, which was ungodly dangerous for the people doing it, but really inefficient. Air brakes, revolution. In fact, that's what cabooses were. When they used to have cabooses, um, that's where the air brake was. Now they have the air brake. It's now just an old system. Uh, you see camera, there's Nicola Benz, uh, first x-ray. X-rays were awesome. Did that kill the first test subject? Oh yeah, it did. What was the test subject? Hmm? Just some guy volunteered. <laughs> I volunteered to do that. I remember, they were still around when I was a little kid, they started getting rid of them, but you go into a shoe store, and you would put your feet in this thing, you push a button and take an x-ray of your foot, so you get the exact precise shoe size. And it was totally Totally, um, un or no insulation, no protection, nothing. It just shot x-rays right into you. Did you feel it? I actually never did it, but I saw people do it. And, oh yeah, this was, yeah, lots of shoes. <laughs> people worked at shoe stores, or I know people did it like over and over again, and, that, and yeah, that would cancer. So one more thing we got to get in 1903, kind of the end of it, we got the airplane. And Orville what Wilbur Wright did, we're not going to go all the details of the airplane. Um, if you've been to the Smithsonian Museum of American History, you can see how small and rickety this plane was. But that first flight, and the only reason I put this up here is think about how much things have changed. Once you have the engine, electricity, all this innovation, the next thing you know, the next century we're flying. It's absolutely remarkable how fast things change. They're already beginning, there's, um, Marconi, who invented the wireless radio, is already talking about television in 1900. This is absolutely remarkable. We have the precursor to computers already at that time. Just 
the change, the level of change because or of innovation because of electricity and because of high quality steel. It's just re unbelievable. We have no conception of this. In a way, it had to be really scary, but since they've already gone through the first industrial revolution, you, once you've gone through change, it's easier to adapt to change. I guess maybe as long as you feel secure. Right now, I think there's a level of change that we're insecure about. I think that's where you see a lot of the insecurity of the country about. But that's the innovation. And so what we're coming up to then is a new, pretty revolutionary society. Very dynamic and very much shifting. We're coming into America as this titanic power because look how big it is. Look at all the natural resources. Look at all the population. All the innovation. And stable government. Okay, yes, we had a little civil war. <laughs> and a near revolution in 1877. But what we're coming up to is an era of now new heading on this on business. But this is where we get the era of cutthroat competition. Now remember, competition is that engine in capitalism that encourages innovation and also keeps prices low. So now we have different companies enter a market. And one thing we gotta remember, before the Civil War, the development of capitalism. And remember, capitalism is a market economy. Now remember what a market is. A market is where people go buy and sell or work or produce in one market producing one good. So like we're talking about in a market as capitalism is in the market of selling dry rice or pens or desks or whatever it might be. No market. We're not talking that's on a micro scale. We're not macro. It's the whole United States aggregate market. Just in the market. Capitalism it functions in a market economy, so competition in a marketplace. But now we have two very distinct people, those who have the capital, called the capitalists, and labor. We're going to come back to this idea. I'm just reviewing what we're talking about. This is a new thing. Before, it was almost always labor, labor and the machines were the same thing. The machine was the worker. Now the machine is the machine. And somebody owns the machine. So by definition, there's already going to be fewer entities in a market because only so many people can own the machines. But now with all this innovation, things are changing much quicker. And you have the capitalist who is now in competition with other capitalists in the market. And what does the capitalist want? Why did Andrew Carnegie, who didn't even really understand what steel was in 1867, buy the Bessemer process to make steel? What did he want? He wanted to fall in love with steel. <laughs> what did he want? Money. He wanted profit. You want profit. And what's the best way to get profit? Sell stuff. Huh? Sell stuff. Sell stuff. But other people sell stuff too. They might have better stuff. What do you want to do? Ah. What you want to do is control the market. That's what you want. Control the market by getting rid of competition, thus the term cutthroat. Do whatever it takes to control the market, to create something that operates like a what? Machine. Well, it could be like a machine, but what? A monopoly. You notice I said operates like a monopoly. It doesn't necessarily have to be one company controlling a market. A couple companies can control a market, and they can be technically competitors, but in reality, it operates like a monopoly or two or three companies. It's called an oligopoly. I'll get to that tomorrow. But a monopoly. And this is the key element about this. Think about it for a second. A monopoly. You get rid of the competition. If it's a product that people want, you can charge whatever you want. And also, a company with a monopoly controls their suppliers, too, of raw materials or goods. If you're the only one buying shirts, let's say, you can go to the companies making shirts and say, I'm only going to pay half of what you sell. What are you going to do about it? And what are they going to do? That's what Walmart does. Walmart goes to shirt clothing manufacturers. They started doing this in the late 80s when they started getting a bigger and bigger market shirts so we could operate like a monopoly. And they went and said, we're going to pay 60% of what you want. You want to find someone else to sell to? Good luck. So what do they do? Hmm? They lower their costs. And how they lower their costs is by taking all their 
that are manufactured now in the United States, moving to Guatemala or Vietnam or the Philippines, where the workers get less than a dollar an hour. When I was your age, both clothes were still made in the U.S. I guarantee you, none of you have anything that's made in the U.S. I'd be, I'd be shocked. Please don't check now. That could get awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't like that. That's what happened. That's what monopolies could do. Also, what, what, if you're the only person hiring workers, what's that do to wages? If only one company's hiring workers, what happens to wages? Hmm? Dramatically. Because there's now no longer competition between different employers. They're saying, this is what you get. Take it or leave it. Competition lowers wages. Or, I'm sorry, competition raises wages, too. You get rid of competition, you cut wages. Now, let's be clear about something real fast. To somebody who's in the market who wants to get as much sales as possible, in their very narrow view, that could be very good for them. But as for the country as a whole, that could be really bad. Because if wages drop, who's going to buy the stuff? And if no one buys the stuff, what happens to the country's total wealth? This is an issue we have. Somebody can be really good at their individual little micro, it's called microeconomics, their market. But that generally means they don't have any idea what to do about the whole macro economy. You know, to run an individual business has nothing to do with running an entire country's economy. In fact, they go counter each other. Because to run the whole country, you want a lot of businesses to do well, not your own. Now, it doesn't mean that this is not an important skill, but it is a different type of economy, economics. It's a, it's a really much more complex thing, but I put that up there because you have this idea by all these individuals. But here's the deal. All these individuals hate the market in competition because it's they want to get rid of it. Capitalists hate capitalism. They won't catch what I just said. They hate it because competition is dangerous and they might lose their money. Now, they would never admit it. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, I hate this thing, that, this engine of wealth. Because they're focused on, I want to control the market. And that's a big issue here. And so, what we have is a new form of capital is forming, and this is where we get the term robber baron. And a robber baron will do whatever it takes, this new capitalism, to control their market. And some could be above board, some could be below board. And... A lot that might be corruption is really in the eye of the beholder. Robber barons come from, the term comes from Germany, the Rhine River. Various knights and <laughs> any thug who they, that's what knights were in medieval Europe, a bunch of thugs and hooligans. But those thugs would get a castle and they, on the Rhine River, go down the Rhine River, this is all of these castles. It's so cool. Okay, I really like castles. Yeah, you should. And moat. Here's the rhyme. All this commerce will go up and down. Each castle, they would charge a toll. Basically, was I hate that something happened to that barge. So you pay and get to the next one, and you pay, and thus robber barons. So that's where the term comes from. And basically, they're making money just because that is spot on the river. It's not because they're smart. It's called the rentier economy. That's another story for another time. But that's where the term comes from. And so what we have here is, here's the issue then. Capitalism creates risk. How do we limit risk? How do we limit risk so we know we can keep making money and operate like a monopoly? And so much of the future of, of the history of the United States is going to be wrapped up to do companies solving risk. Where were you? I got a flat tire with Ethan, and so it took a long time. So, I like how he said with Ethan, so you're blaming him. Well, he was sitting on that side of the truck. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what he was doing. <laughs> but it wasn't good. <laughs> I thought he checked in. He said, I just don't like it. Just uh, the next year. I, uh, I will never forgive you for that, but. <laughs> My dad how dare you ride with Ethan? All right, so. Let me just say this real quick. Let me, <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> Well, I was riding with Ethan. <laughs> All right, so risk. I'm going to come up with methods to control risk. 
And the first most important way is to control risk, you want to get rid of your competition. Get rid of your competition, cut costs. How do you cut costs? Oh, there's lots of ways to cut costs. The biggest way to cut costs is to become more efficient. That's where Henry, did you hear that too? What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if they do that there to get this other class and they're all way in the door. Bell to bell here. I do that for you. <laughs> efficient. What we got to get here is become more efficient at producing. And what did Henry Ford for fact in the assembly? Tomorrow we'll finish this. Because we got to get to the beast. The beast is coming. James, I'm glad you could show up.